Hello, and in this video we're going to be thinking about how leaves are adapted for photosynthesis. And you can see the IGCSE learning outcomes there in the box, wouldn't you know? The first thing to think about with a leaf is its overall shape. And you can see that it is wide and thin, meaning that it's got a really large surface area to volume ratio. And that, of course, is going to be extremely important for absorbing all the carbon dioxide it needs for photosynthesis and for absorbing as much light energy as possible. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a transverse section of the leaf just here. So we're going to have a look at this section as you would cut through a leaf. We're going to look at it, first of all, in a diagrammatic form, and then we're going to look at some photos we've taken down a microscope. So, in diagrammatic form, it looks approximately like this. Uh, we've got the various layers to it, the upper epidermis layer, the mesophyll layer. Now, mesophyll just means the middle, uh, the middle of the leaf. And we've got two parts of the mesophyll layer, the palisade and the spongy mesophyll layers. And then we've got the lower epidermis underneath. Uh, in this diagram here, taken from Jones and Jones, an old textbook, uh, we can see just the cells filled in in one particular line. They could have filled them all in, they didn't. Uh, so don't be confused that these are blank spaces here. We've got then our uh, upper epidermis cells with no chloroplasts, we've got palisade cells, and we'll think about all these adaptations as we go through. We also have here the vascular bundle or vein as it's labelled here with xylem vessel and phloem tube as well. Okay, well let's have a look at one. Here we have an actual cross section through a leaf uh, rather than that diagrammatic one. And when thinking about its adaptations, I want us to think about this. This equation that I've given at the top is called Fick's Law, and it describes the rate of diffusion and the factors that affect it. So at the top of the equation, you can see you've got surface area times difference in concentration. Now that means if you've got a larger surface area, the rate of diffusion will be faster. Likewise, if the difference in concentration between one place and another is high, then diffusion will be faster. So, for example, if there's a low concentration of CO2 there and a high concentration of CO2 out here in the atmosphere, then there's going to be a large difference in concentration and therefore the rate of diffusion will be faster. Now, the thing that will make diffusion slower is if things have got a long way to go. So, if the distance of diffusion is high, then diffusion will be slower. So, with that in mind, let's have a think about how this leaf is adapted to maximise the rate of photosynthesis. Well, here are some labels for us. Uh, we've got the same labels that we had in the diagram before, the upper epidermis, the palisade mesophyll cells, the spongy mesophyll cells, the air spaces, and the lower epidermis. How does all of this help? Well, the leaf has got to get everything that it needs for photosynthesis in order to do photosynthesis. And let's remind ourselves of what those things are with our equation. For photosynthesis, we have CO2 plus well, let's give it 6, 6 CO2 plus 6 H2O goes to C6H12O6 plus 6O2. And in order to do this, it needs light energy. To get hold of all the things it needs, it needs carbon dioxide. It needs water, it needs light. And then it's going to need to get rid of oxygen. It's going to need to move on the glucose that it makes. It's going to have to do something with it. How does it get all these? Let's think about the carbon dioxide to start off with. Where is it needed? It's going to be needed in the palisade mesophyll cells. Those are the cells which have got the most chloroplasts and are going to be doing the most photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide has got to get there. And the way it gets there is as the palisade mesophyll cells use CO2, therefore the concentration of CO2 is low. Out here we've got a high we'll call it high-ish concentration of CO2. Um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is only 0.04% and that's rounded up to 0.04%. So from the plant's point of view it's a very rare gas. Nonetheless this is going to use up CO2 in photosynthesis so have a low concentration of CO2 in here, so low just to emphasize that, 
uh, and therefore we've got a difference in concentration between inside and outside. So we've got a concentration gradient going in this way. But how's the carbon dioxide going to get in? Well, we've got uh, a stoma down here, uh, and we've got these air spaces here. So the air spaces allow carbon dioxide to diffuse in from the outside to the palisade mesophyll cells. So we have the spongy mesophyll cells to thank for that. Uh, so thank you very much, spongy mesophyll cells. What else have we got going on here? Well, we need light to be able to get to our palisade mesophyll cells. How does that occur? Well, we've got the upper epidermis here, and let's just look at that now. So we've zoomed into the top part of the leaf, and we've got some labels here, our palisade mesophyll cells here, and our waxy cuticle. This cell here is of the upper epidermis layer, so this all is upper epidermis. Now the upper epidermis cells have two characteristic features. One, they have no chloroplasts. And that means that light can penetrate through them to get to all these chloroplasts down here. Uh, you can see some blobs in here, but those aren't chloroplasts. This is probably a nucleus or whatever it might be. These are shriveled up cells which have been treated. The next thing they do is they secrete this layer of wax called the waxy cuticle. You can see it here, stained red. That waxy cuticle is very good for waterproofing. The leaf doesn't want to lose too much water, and it secretes this waxy cuticle in order to do that. It also helps to prevent fungal infections, so when fungal spores land on a leaf, they can't just dive straight into the cells. They have the waxy cuticle to hold them off. The layer underneath then is the palisade mesophyll layer, and it's made out of these palisade mesophyll cells. These are in particular characterized by the fact that they have got loads of chloroplasts. Now in an exam I'd probably write many chloroplasts rather than loads of chloroplasts, but you know, you can do what you like. Uh, but hey, we're going to call it loads of chloroplasts for this one. Now, the fact that they've got loads and loads of chloroplasts means that they've got a lot of chlorophyll, which is contained in those chloroplasts. And because you've got a lot of chlorophyll there, then you've got a lot of chlorophyll to absorb light energy. And so that is going to be requisite for photosynthesis. That's going to speed it up. Okay, let's move on. This is a diagrammatic form of the palisade cell structure. You're probably pretty familiar with this diagram. Um, but just to emphasize, it's got all these various things in it, your cell wall, cell membrane, vacuole, cytoplasm, mitochondria, remember they're from respiration, they are where aerobic respiration takes place, and then lots and lots of chloroplasts, loads of chloroplasts. Let's zoom in now to the lower epidermis, and we can see here lower epidermal cells, but in particular I want to look at these. Now, this here is a gap. That gap is called a stoma. And it is through a stoma that CO2 can diffuse in. And of course, we also need, we're going to produce oxygen, so O2 is going to be able to diffuse out. We're going to have a higher concentration of oxygen inside and a lower concentration outside, so O2 will diffuse out. You'll see also there's a maybe a thinner waxy cuticle here, secreted by the lower epidermal cells. The size of each stoma is determined by the guard cells on either side of it. Really, that's going to be dependent on how much water is available. When there's lots of water available, then the stoma will swell up nicely and expand, and, will, and that will open up each stoma. Let's have a look at that. We've got guard cells here. That's a guard cell. And by the way, we're looking upwards now onto the underside of a leaf. Upwards onto the underside of a leaf. And this in the middle is simply a hole, um, which is a stoma, or plural. As uh, we said on the other screen, stomata. Now the guard cell has slightly thicker cellulose on this side of it, which means that when it swells up, it expands, but this side stretches less than this side out here, which means that it expands in a funny way, a little bit 
as if you've put a bit of sellotape on one of those long balloons and then try to blow up the balloon. You'll find the balloon bends around, and that's what's going on here with the guard cell. Next thing to look at is the vein, the vascularity, the vascular bundle. This is it around here, and it's made out of two main parts, the xylem and underneath it, the phloem. Now the xylem carries water and mineral ions to the leaves, whereas the phloem carries away the photosynthetic product. So all the stuff that it makes in photosynthesis uh, are carried away by the phloem. Now I don't know if you can make out from here, but xylem are pretty regular shapes. You can see there's a kind of hexagonal shape to that one there, and they're quite thick walled. Here they're stained red as well. Phloem may be slightly uh, narrower vessels, but always phloem on the underside. Xylem on top, phloem on the underside of the leaf there. Across here, what you've got is a vein, uh, or one of these vascular bundles, which is kind of stretching out from this, and then you've got a little cross-section through it. And again, there's the xylem up the top there, and then the phloem just underneath it there. Now, why is this necessary? All of these cells have got to have water. If they don't have water, they're not going to be able to photosynthesize, they're not going to be able to live even. And that's what's going to be brought to them by the xylem. Furthermore, the phloem are needed to take away all the products of photosynthesis. If not, then the leaf is just going to accumulate far too much sucrose, and the rest of the plant isn't going to get any. So the xylem and the phloem, both being really close to the palisade cells, which are doing the majority of the photosynthesis, is really, really useful. Well, let's summarize some of these things here. And we're going to think about this in terms of structure and function. Number one, structure. Well, we've got a very large surface area to these leaves, which means that you've got a large surface area for light and carbon dioxide absorption. A leaf is very thin, which means that sunlight can penetrate to all cells. Uh, even those guard cells at the bottom in the lower epidermis, they have some chloroplasts in them, and the light can penetrate to them. It also means that there's not very far from the stomata to the cells for carbon dioxide to diffuse too. Do you remember we said that the rate of diffusion is going to be sped up if your diffusion distance is not very far? Well, there's a short distance because the leaf is thin. You have the stomata in the lower epidermis which allows CO2 to diffuse in and O2 out during photosynthesis. No chloroplast in the upper epidermis means that light can get to those mesophyll layers properly. Palisade cells have got many chloroplasts so you've got maximum chlorophyll to absorb light energy. Xylem vessels are close to the mesophyll cells, which means that water and mineral ions can quickly diffuse to the mesophyll cells. And phloem tubes close to the mesophyll cells, getting rid of, well, removing the products of photosynthesis, such as sucrose. So can you test yourself? To test yourself, try to remember which each of these labels are and then to think about how each of these features once you've labeled them help to maximize the rate of photosynthesis and there's your little clue at the bottom rate of diffusion etc 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 have a go at that and see how you do and i hope that helps